Hi, this is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, host of The Intersection, where diverse folks converse. Created by and for queer people of color and gender non-conforming people, The Intersection is curated side by side with some of the most brilliant and fascinating minds in our community. I create these programs keeping in mind all of the things that aren't said and all of the things that we aren't able to talk about within heterosexual and cisgendered produced shows. In the intersection, you'll find firsthand what the leading voices of our community are thinking, the work they're producing, the concerns they have, and what they hope for us and what they leave behind in their legacy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, my name is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, and you're here with the intersection Diverse Folks Converse. I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Karma Chavez, and this is for season two, episode two, which is titled I'm Bulletproof and I Don't Give a Fuck. Queer Women of Color Scholar Dr. Karma Chavez talks mentorship, tokenism, and intersectionally queering our workspaces. So, so glad to have you here, Karma. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we uh, we do these cl- these shows together. So even though I'm the host, I actually collaborate with each of my guests. And uh, maybe we can just like talk a little bit about how we came to this topic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, you know our original conversation about what we might want to talk about really ended up sort of drifting in ways I don't know if either of us necessarily expected, uh, but it seemed like we we resonated a lot on some of these themes and our very different sorts of relationships to academia. I don't know if that resonates with you. Yeah, no. And then one one thing, I don't know why I put you on the spot. I usually just say it. <laughs> well, everything you said was great. I One thing that I think about is that I came to your work sort of late in my career and when I actually found like your very prolific <laughs> like uh, like list of articles and books, and then like realized you're in my field, you know, very close to home in communication studies and rhetoric and, and critical theory, I was just really enthralled by your work and just like really excited to the potential of talking to you, especially because I have taken a step away from academia. And I think that's, you know, p- going to be part of our conversation today is just like pulling apart those threads of what does it mean to be a queer woman of color in academia, you know, right now, <laughs> how has it been for you? And that, I think that was one of the first, this is actually how we came just to give the background for the, for our listeners is this is how we came to the title. As I asked Karma, I said, you know, how did you do this? Because the fact that, uh, you know, Karma is, is a, is a scholar of migration studies and I feel like has paved this completely different way that I had never heard of before. Also, you know, Karma is a department chair and associate professor, Department of Mexican American Latino Studies, University of Texas at Austin. And just, you know, this is kind of like the height that people like me, when we start out, we kind of dream to get to this place, right? And so, I think seeing your profile, reading your literature, uh, and then like meeting you and you're so cool, it was like really, you know, very inspiring for me. And I thought for a lot of other queer people of color scholars and people of color scholars and people in in the working world too, it's like, how did you pave this way? And so that's actually the words, and this is why we have it in quotes, that Karma said, Karma said, like, I'm bulletproof and I don't give a fuck. And I was like, we are going to call your episode that because I really love that. (laughs) And so this is sort of like, you know, we are going to kind of just pull apart and maybe just like blow up the conventions of academia is what I kind of what we talked about before. I don't know if you're still in that mood. (laughs) Let's just like talk frankly, you know, about like our experiences. And, you know, I want to hear more about your work. And we have a, a performance piece from Adrian Pfeiffer, Cornered from 19, that talks about miscegenation that we want to talk about as, you know, both being lighter skinned uh, women of color who are in academia as well. 
Yeah, there is definitely, and then I think we can talk about Adrian's, you know, piece. I'd like to think about Adrian Pfeiffer's piece because, and I want to read a quote that's directly uh, from this piece. If you don't know this piece, uh, it came out in 1988, and I actually don't have the name of the gallery it came from, but we can put it in our liner notes later. Uh, it was it was a really important piece because. Uh, she talked about being in an Ivy League university and the types of things that were being said to her. I have a memory. I, don't, I know I didn't see the original. I think it may have been redone and I saw it in San Francisco, maybe at the MoMA or something. But I have a memory of like walking in and seeing this whole thing. And something that's really interesting about it in reference to what we're talking about is the sort of like stickiness of, you know, talking about racism and white supremacy. Uh, when you are a mixed race or, or you identify as biracial and how it both um, perhaps makes, you know, certain issues that have to, that, that are very prevalent with other people of color sort of like retreat from the forefront, but at the same time becomes confrontative in another way. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's discussed a lot. So uh, her quote and just to set up the piece and what it looks like is it's a, it's a screen and there's a bench that's turned toward the screen. And I believe there's two things on either side. So it's literally like she is cornered and it's in the corner, I think, too. But, or maybe not. Maybe that's too literal. I think, I think so, yeah. It is in the corner. Okay, okay. It is in the corner. And uh, and she's cornered in, right? So she has been cornered. She's been cornered by her, uh, her racial identity, by how she's received by others, by what she has access to and yet how she's treated. And so I'm just going to go ahead and read this uh, very shocking, I love it though, statement from, from her piece. It's a genetic and social fact that according to the entrenched conventions of racial classification in this country, you are probably black. So if I choose to identify myself as black, whereas you do not, that's not just a special personal fact about me. It's a fact about us. It's our problem to solve. So how do you propose we solve it? What are we going to do? And I, I'm curious about like your first response to that, especially thinking about what you were saying about how the labor that queer people of color and people of color take on in academia, right? I would say very oftentimes when something that has to do with white supremacy or uh, racism comes up in a department, it's very difficult to ask those last two questions, right? Mm -hmm. How do you propose we solve it? What are we going to do? Typically, you know, if you, especially if you're the only person of color in a committee or so on, people turn to you and they're like, what should we do? <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, what does that bring up for you? I'd love to know. Well, so much, right? I mean, <laughs> it is, uh, I mean, the, the work is poignant, that quotation is, is poignant. And I, so I think a few things. One is she's calling us to consider what racial identity even is. Yes. Right? So she's, she's asking us, and it's actually more interesting to think about not 1988, but now with the sort of prevalence of genetic testing and yes. you know, everybody's interested in, in what their background is. Whereas then you didn't really have access to this, right? So it's all sort of speculation. But you know, she she's asking us what makes a racial identity, um, and is it blood? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the way you look? Uh, is it who your people are? Right? Is it a combination of all that? And if we pause for a minute and say it is in fact blood, and there's good reason to believe that you have as much of this blood as I do. Yes. Um, but you identify like this, I identify like that. Um, turns out actually at some deep level, it's both of our problem. And I think what she's really trying to do is um, one, make white people feel uncomfortable with their proximity for sure. to blackness. Um, but two, you know, ensure that if they are the same genetically, then how come it's just her problem? Yes. Um, and it is absolutely. I mean, as you said, you know, something's going, you're in a dominant white department, dominant white office, something's going wrong with regard to race. And it's like, everybody's head will turn to you. Yeah. Or anybody's diversity liaison or, you know, 
whatever these people are in, in corporate world, uh, always a person of color. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's asking us to holistically be accountable. She's yeah. not just putting it on white people. I, I, I am really curious that right now, I, I'd le- love to talk a little bit about the part that has to do with the tokenism aspect of, of this topic, which I think is, is, is often not spoken about, at, at least not in a complex way, because you had said also you felt like there was definitely a lot of some difficulties you went through as someone who was lighter skin, but th- you felt like perhaps, you know, there were some, there were some access that was afforded to you being lighter skinned uh, with the white scholars who were senior to you, who were around you. I'd love to hear a little bit about that when maybe we can bridge that into Adrian Pfeiffer's work as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a mixed race kid. I'm light skin. Um, I grew up around a lot of white folks because mm-hmm. I grew up in rural Nebraska. So weren't a lot of POC there, yeah. your folks, anybody really <laughs> different. Sure. Uh, you know, so I'm palatable yeah. to white folks. I'm palatable in terms of uh, the way I communicate, uh, my skin, uh, my background even, right? Uh, even though, you know, I was a working class kid, I didn't go to elite institutions or anything like this. Um, but there, I'm one of many. So many people of color in the academy are people of color like me, meaning mixed race kids who have white mothers. Yeah. So, or white fathers, but I think actually it's more white mothers and that's, you know, something we could talk about too. But um, there's, if I start to think about, you know, POC in the academy, yeah. the list could go on and on about folks who are mixed race. So what happens? Already, and maybe it's getting better, maybe it's not, I don't know, but generally people of color in the department they're in, unless they're in ethnic studies, they're the only one or they're one of two or in really good case, maybe three, right? And those three maybe are not all of the same race. You might have one, you know, black, one non-black Latino and one Asian, right? Sure. Like (laughs) you're not going to have very rarely like three black folks in the same department. So already people of color are tokenized. But then people of color like me, mixed race, palatable folks, light skinned folks are even more Hmm. tokenized. And we become stand ins for uh, people of color who are less palatable. And so it's like, well, we hired karma. Like I, you know, can remember like feeling this way when I was at Wisconsin. It's like, you know, I was there. And so I became alibi. It's not just token, but now alibi, Mm. right? Or vouch. And, um, it's like, well, it's not really hard to incorporate me if I can live up to your standards, whatever they are. But what about people who are very different from you? And so I think people like me have to be really mindful about the role that we are put into to play and to resist that role the best mm-hmm. we can. Because otherwise, um, not only do we become alibi, not only do we become vouched, not only do we become token but we become justification and rationale for keeping other people of color who aren't like us. Out. Yes. And that absolutely participates in white supremacy, anti-blackness. For and sure. So forth. There's definitely something in what you're saying that's interesting to me in, you know, you're talking about sort of like the, what's palatable uh, in in the way that you were tokenized or the way that you uh, were received perhaps by the people the white people around you the white scholars uh, I think from my experience being uh, a biracial you know Asian woman is I'm actually like even though I have it in my name you know which is constantly mispronounced <laughs> uh, I am seen as just invisible so I don't know if that's a tokenism or not but you know how many times have I been part of a conference? panel or a publication and perhaps there's one African American person, you know, included and, and I'm organizing it with two, you know, white folks and they say, oh, well, we, you know, um, and then this is offensive in and of itself. We can't drop him because he's the only person of color, you know, which is, mm-hmm. you know, a problem. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a person of color, <laughs> not right. saying we should drop him, but like, 
you know, yeah. uh, like I'm a person of color. So, and then, you know, that being very offensive to them because they thought I was white adjacent to the point to where I, you know, the Wong just drops out of my name, perhaps. I don't know. So mm -hmm. that happens to me over and over again. And I don't know what you call that. Uh, it's a uh, invisible tokenism. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. Yeah, I don't know what you call that. But I mean, <laughs> I think it also speaks to the fact that you know, uh, Latinos and Blacks and, and Asian folks are are um, interpolated differently. Yes, into white supremacy, and sure. so it uses us in different ways. What is it? What does it evoke for you? Uh, this is something I talked about in a previous episode with Lily Jung, who is one of those diversity, equity, inclusion strategists, and mm -hmm. really good. I think you'd really like their work. And we were talking about uh, cancel culture, purity politics, and disposability politics within DEI, and even could be, you know, considered within very socially active, you know, academic departments or different subfields. Uh, and and what does it mean to come together as a collective, right? How does how do these exclusionary politics work within our own communities, and how does you know? Adrian Pfeiffer's work to me, like really helps challenge that notion of like, what does it mean to be a community? What does it mean to be a collective? What does it mean to, to realize that otherness resides within you? Like you said, genetically, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you look back at like old, women of color writing, black feminist writing, Chicana feminist writing about, uh, you know, coalition, right? Yeah. I mean, the message is very clear, like coalition is not home. Yes. Uh, coalition is what you do because you have to. Um, and so even the idea of people of color, women of color, queer women of color, queer people of color, these are all coalitional terms themselves. Uh, and so, you know, they, that means they don't exist, but for people's efforts hmm. uh, to make them exist. And part of coalition, if, if coalition is not home, it means, well, every time you leave your home, you know, you're going to deal with some bullshit. Yes. And you have to make a decision about what to do with that. And, and part of, I think the task of coalition is it's not your job to teach the people with more power than you. But on the other hand, if we're in a collective project, uh, it is our job um, to to work towards whatever that end is. And part of that might be dealing with people you don't like and dealing with people who say things that are fucked up. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't have a, a lot of time for the kind of cancel culture phenomenon. At the same time, it's absolutely imperative that we are in ethical and accountable ways bringing people to account when they do harm to the community, right? And I think yeah. that's a tough balance. That's probably one of the most fascinating pieces of, or parts of, of this work for me, although there, I think there, there are multiple layers. Uh, you know, what happens when we question what otherness means uh, and how does it change just that notion of what accountability is, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like one of the things Piper's work also does is, uh, you know, talks about this sort of challenge of being a light skinned person who's also a person of color, because then you have to deal with all the bullshit that white people say. Um, and that's an interesting additional burden, right? And, you know, I've kind of dealt with this my whole life as well. Um, I can remember like kind of a most poignant example was years ago, I was uh, riding in a car with a white woman who happened to be a sister of a mentor of mine. And I can't remember why we were in a car together, but we were. And, you know, she started going on and on about, so it's not someone I know. Yes. Uh, starts going on and on about how the drivers in Phoenix are so terrible. Um, and I said, well, yeah, you know, it's like one of the worst places for driving in the country, actually, you know, on like objective measures. And she's like, well, it's because of all the fucking Mexicans. Oh my gosh. And I was like, and I said, well, you know, I'm Mexican, right? 
And she was like, what? She's like, well, you're not one of those Mexicans. Oh, right? yeah. And that one. So, I mean, I think there's that kind of weird burden, but it's, it shouldn't be, you know, it's also your responsibility because sure. of how you look, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, it kind of reminds me of I've had friends who were who are trans masculine and, you know, them being in, in all male spaces and, and hearing the stuff they hear. Right. Mm -hmm. And having previously identified as, as a woman and that still being like a part they carry with them and, and being like, you don't, I really wish I could unhear this stuff, you know, like the burden of, 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 of being able to cross over into these different spaces and perhaps, you know, not expecting to hear the things that you hear and it being directed at you, but the person who's saying it doesn't know they're directing it at you. Right. 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 Yeah. It's yeah. a really, I think it's a really strange phenomenon. You're about midway through the intersection. Diverse folks converse podcast. I wanted to take a moment to let you know why I created the intersection. It was because I didn't see a lot of representation of the most brilliant and creative minds in our communities. All I saw were misrepresentations in popular culture and the media. So I wanted to provide a free and accessible outlet for us all to enrich our lives and to provide meaning for the things that we experience every single day. None of us get paid for the intersection, and this is not a income generating endeavor for any of us. We do this because we want to add to our culture and we want to add to your lives. So we just ask that you participate as well and contribute to us through subscribing to our channel and, and leaving reviews and telling your friends and telling the community, put it up on web boards, share it in social media, tell people about us, but really subscribing, adding the reviews to Dr. Shannon Wong Learner's YouTube channel, which houses the intersection to the intersection on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is really the best way to let other people know about us and to help us increase our visibility so we can increase yours. Thank you so much and you can now return to the show and thank you for listening. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we mentioned this before and we don't have to name names, but I, I had said that someone who was, uh, you know, someone who was higher up than me, who was a professor, had said one of the, the most uh, awful things that could happen is you speak in a room and the people around you don't understand what you're saying. And then there's this alienation, right, that happens. And I was like, that happens to me every day. <laughs> I always remember saying that. Yeah. And he was serious. I mean, he looked at his face and, you know, he was used to going into a room and speaking and commanding the room at every time, you know, whether yeah. there might have been times he didn't and he thought he was, I don't know. But just the fact that he had that, you know, the power and the dominance of speech. And like you said, these, these white supremacist racist uh, narratives, even like within your book. And I, like I said, I, I can't believe I never thought of that before is like, how many films have we seen about white gay men during this time, but we almost never see films. I mean, things shows like pose and it's cause some recent, some recent uh, films are changing that, but like all throughout my childhood and my teenage years, I kept, I, those are the faces I saw. Those are the stories I knew. I didn't know these other stories. Right. And so when I think of academia and I think about, you know, the story I was wrapped up as part of, right. As someone who, you know, I would say like, it took me years to figure out some of the, those structures, like why it was problematic that, that professor had said that and and why my response was you know should have been also responded to right it's like oh well let's change that i mean this is like you know hollywood sure. or something you know hallmark or hollywood let's change it we've got to have a meeting and talk about systemic racism and how discourses aren't aligned with like people of colors like experiences right no i uh it's so interesting to hear your story because i think 
you know, me being from California and having almost all white friends when I was growing up and kind of also having that same experience of just being like, am I a person of color? Like, what am I exactly? And then, you know, having a lot of Asian friends, you know, from Korea, Japan, China, when I went to undergrad and then them kind of trying to corral me in, you know, <laughs> like, you know, and I was taking Chinese and I was working in Chinatown and like learning about my culture basically. Uh, but then there was also this thing where like, you know, like you're white, you're white, you know, not even like you're part white, you're white, you know, cause I'm American too. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but I had the very opposite response when I was in graduate school. I so wish I would have had those, uh, that same voice with that I had in undergrad, but within my master's to kind of like corral me back because I was so, I was like walking on pins and needles when I was uh, in my doctoral program. I was just trying to do everything right. Of course, I was like closeted too. So I was like <laughs> a totally different person. I look at pictures of myself and I'm like, who the hell is that person? <laughs> but, and actually, so this is my first time I've worn something like this because uh, I haven't been out that long. Almost all the clothes I have that are dress up clothes are femme clothes. So you, typically when I come to a podcast, I'm rushing here, I dress up. And then I get here and then I look at the screen and I'm like, oh shit, I did it again. Like I didn't, I didn't even know what I looked like, you know? So purposefully, because we're talking about queer woman of color swagger, which is the next thing I want to talk about. I wore this, uh, it's not a raincoat. It looks dark like me. It is. It's actually gray. So it's like a suit jacket. I wanted to wear this today. It's like my first time wearing this anyway. Yes. <laughs> thanks. I wish I would have had that swagger and I wish I would have known that's what it was. Cause I did feel I would make this joke and then these are white references, whatever it's from my time period. But I, when I spoke in class, I felt like I either sounded like Melanie Griffith or like Marilyn, Mon Marilyn Monroe without the sexual connotation, <laughs> like this very wispy, <laughs> whispery voice where people are like, what? Or I was like Sam Kinison. I was like screaming, you know, people are like, stop her from talking. So it was like, I always, and I don't think I was doing either of those things. I think it was all in my head, you know, cause I was trying to get my voice out and I couldn't, yeah. I, I couldn't get my voice out. If I did get my voice out and I knew I had a good idea, I knew I was like, Per critically looking at this reading in this other way that was like really important, almost never got, it was like, you're crazy. Right. And it was interesting because I was listening to this physicist yesterday. He's a black physicist. And he was saying like, most of the groundbreaking ideas that have come from black physicists have been interpreted as crazy. Right. Yep. But these were like groundbreaking, you know, realizations or whatever you want to call it. And mm -hmm. so, um, for me, and this is part of what this, this, I think this episode is about, it's like me unlearning that, that crazy voice, right? Or the, 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 the voice that either can't be heard or is too loud is like setting mm -hmm. off an alarm and just standing in that, you know, queer woman of color <laughs> swagger. <laughs> I want to learn that. And, um, I'm not going to get cowboy boots though, but, um, <laughs> if that's you might want to really <laughs> they're quite comfortable <laughs> okay i just feel like it's not part of my um wardrobe well but, you'll find your own swagger yeah here maybe i'll find my own uh but i'd love to hear more about that is like when you got to your doctoral program you made that decision you're like i'm gonna stand in a place where i feel grounded i feel empowered i feel like myself and i'm just gonna like do this thing right i'm not gonna like play politics. I'm not, I'm putting words in your mouth. So tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm, this is what I thought I heard you say. I'm not going to play politics. I'm not going to like do all the stuff that people tell me to do that I don't trust in the first place. Right. I'm just going to like do this thing. I'm going to be passionate about it. I wish I would have had that. I was passionate, but like not in a way that connected, or I feel like I didn't take advantage of things like I should have. I didn't, I wasn't dominant, you know, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about that. And also in terms of like, you know, the culture of swagger and what that means. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know, it's like such a weird thing, right? Because it's attached to masculinity, which gets attached to all sorts of other things that are, you know, sometimes problematic. I mean, I think I was like, you know, just raised by 
parents who were very invested in me having a voice, yeah, uh, even when it was terrible for them. Um, <laughs> And, you know, for the most part, everybody around me, I was, you know, my mom always talks about how I I started talking at six months and just haven't shut up since, basically. (laughs) That's great. Uh, You know, and I don't know, I think I, um, I think I was probably always pretty competitive in a way. And I just, um, it's, I don't, I I don't know. I had a, a roommate in my, one of my first roommates in college and And she said to me once, she said, you know, you are the most confident person that I have ever met. And I was like, me? (laughs) Uh, And she was like, yeah, you. And I thought, and I kind of just like took that. I mean, I wonder if she she probably didn't ever remember saying that. But I kind of was like, all right, well, if that's what somebody sees, like, that's how I'm going to be. And, you know, it kind of came into like coming into my own, like, with sexuality. Because like, I, I was like this like tomboy dikey brown kid in nebraska so it's not like i was the object of anyone's desire growing up uh, but then like at the college and get to grad school and it's like you know all of a sudden like chicks dig me yeah um, <laughs> and i was like so and you know i behaved badly with that <laughs> sure um but there was something about i don't know that too just kind of the notion of desire and um i don't know just the i guess an insistence on owning whatever room i'm in I don't there's know also, why. There's also like that desire of speech, right? Since we're both communication people, maybe we could talk a moment about that. Because I do feel like, you know, if you think about that in terms of sexuality orientation and, and uh, you know, racial identity so to, as well and culture and background, there is like a passionate way. When I look back at like my doctoral program, I've always spoken like very passionately, right? Uh, and perhaps that's part of why I couldn't stand in my power in that moment in a way that felt fully integrated as not having been out, right? I like, I, I think I told you this before, I should have known because, you know, when people come out late, they look back and try to trace it, you know, and like most of the people know around you, especially people who are queer, they're like, we knew that. <laughs> so like when you come out, you're like all nervous. It's like very anticlimactic because people are like, yeah. yes, and. Like, we're so you glad know? you finally figured it out. <laughs> but like I had written this, my first published piece was all on uh, feminine morphology, right? <laughs> Which is like the language structure, culture of like, you know, feminine vaginal forms. <laughs> I wrote this. I was like yeah. very fascinated and devoted to this piece. <laughs> and then wrote about it with my uh creative partner who's straight, but I remember her husband reading it be like, kind of sounds like you guys are gay. You know? <laughs> it's like, well one of us is. But uh where was I going with that? There was something. Else. <laughs> oh, I got lost. In the- you got distracted by the <laughs> I vaginal just, form. I started thinking about the article. But no, thinking about like you know, what does it mean to be, you know, sexually empowered to be in who you are? Like you came to fruition in that in your undergraduate years, it sounds like, which must have been awesome. <laughs> and a I little coming- bit, although it's still kind of, you know, it was kind of closeted and not not with like close friends, but yeah, you know, with like a Christian school. And stuff, I see. So, yeah. Well, I'm coming to that now, which is like, you Welcome. know. It's never too late, I guess. But it's interesting to think about that now. And this is the first time I've really thought about that is like communicating and speech coming from a queer place and coming from a queer woman of color place. How is that different? How does that differ? Maybe we can even think about some of the, you know, black lesbian poets whom we adore and how they kind of set the, you know, the the way for us or pave the way for us to do that. Do you, Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think there's, you know, there's so much. If you look back at the writing of queer women of color, if you look back at the the art, if you yes. look at, back at the photography and, and you look at some of the kind of bold ways they just chose to inhabit. Um, you could think about Gloria Anseltua, you could think about Audre Lorde, you could think yes. about uh, June Jordan and just like, they were just there in their space and they um, dealt with so much fucking bullshit, but sure. they also just own their right to be there, you know, and in spite of it all, in spite of the risk of violence, in spite of being booted out of PhD programs or having to work shithole working class jobs that were going to give them cancer or, you know, 
there was, I don't know. And it, I'm probably really romanticizing it. I was actually, well, I wasn't thinking about you, but I was thinking about that with my thoughts. It's weird that you said that. There's yeah. kind of an idealization of those voices, right? In the way mm -hmm. they wrote and in the way that we perceive them from that time period to now, I think. Yeah. But yeah. they're also, you know, one thing that flashed on me is what we're talking about miscegenation and Adrian Pfeiffer and like, is it possible that it's more difficult to inhabit that voice as someone who's lighter skinned, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's a weird thing to say, but if you do inhabit that voice, how are you received by the people around you, whether they're white or people of color? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to think through it a bit more, right? Um, I mean, I can only you know speak from the confines of this flesh and what that experience has been for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I just, I'm just, I was just, you know, kind of like thinking out loud on that topic, just thinking about, you know, because when I do think of those voices, I think of my undergraduate years, right, before I even knew I was queer at all. And the way those voices were treated, like in a poetry program at San Francisco State University, which I believe was the first place to have like an ethnic studies, mm -hmm. you know, major for undergraduate. And it yep. has like a strong, you know, a political foothold there within the left. Uh and the way those voices are treated and the and the impact that had on me. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, where I am now and how I see myself and my voice and my strength and, you know, still figuring that out, I guess, too. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of taking it around cir a full circle to think about the young people or not so young people out there who are starting their careers or maybe a second career in academia. And, you know, perhaps anything you can think of or maybe looking back at like a, you know, baby karma or something, anything you can think of advice you'd give yourself when you were having like a really difficult time navigating these spaces in what you know now and say whatever you want. I'm not telling you to make it into like a positive message necessarily, but. Yeah. I think it's challenging because, you know, what I, what I want to say to people is don't spend your whole time trying to make white people happy. Um, but the truth is, unless you're an ethnic studies program, a few other programs, you're going to actually have to make some white people happy to get your sure. damn degree. Yeah, sure. So, um, but I think, I'm only just realizing this a lot this summer. My um, mentor in grad school, who's a white gay man, committed yeah. suicide in May. And man, that's fucked me up real, real hard this summer for a lot of reasons. One of which is I, even though he and I had sort of been estranged for a number of years because of this, but I held on to a lot of other white folks um, that I didn't need to. <laughs> and then actually still, uh, in the same way that he did damage to me, uh, for some reason I was tolerating it in these other people. I don't know why hmm. long after they had any power over my life, but I had concocted in my head, some significance to these relationships. And they were significant. He's like people I love dearly. Um, you know, and him too, my mentor who died, you know, we used to vacation together. He visited me every place I ever lived. You know, we communicated all the time via text message, whatnot. Um, but he was a shit in a lot of ways. Yeah. And these other folks I've realized through the summer and reflecting my relationship with him are too. So all that's to say is you're going to have to make some white people happy, but at the point when you no longer do for any material reason for your future, don't any longer, Yeah. um, understand the difference between the function that you served for them and the function they serve for you and don't confuse that for love or whatever. Yeah. Um, in some cases it might be, but get some clarity on that. Uh, because I finished my PhD in 2007. Here we are 2021 and I'm just letting go. Yes. Of some of those folks. Sure. And it's, uh, you know, even kind of the hold that ha the culture has on you, I think for years took me, someone in the program had come to me like, Shannon, these things happened to you. This happened to me. This happened to these other people. And, you know, 
I think I was brainwashed or something. Like I didn't even see it. I was still in a survival place and I didn't yeah. realize that those things had happened. And uh, just recently have been like letting go of those things. You have to like kind of feel it, you know, before you can let it go, but also realizing that my, and exactly what you said, you know, the idea of, of confusing like a, a love or a friendship or so on for uh, functionality and, uh, and I guess like coming to your own value and staying in touch with that, staying in touch with your community and the people who really know you, it's like super important, just like any abusive relationship that cuts you off from your support yeah. system. Don't let that happen. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think these are all like really good, you know, words of wisdom. I would uh, love for us to talk about and for people the, for our listeners to hear more about how they can learn more about your work and, you know, per, perhaps, you know, purchase your current book and the border of AIDS race, quarantine and resistance or any of your other books. How, how can they, how can they, do you have a website or. I'm <laughs> terrible about having any kind of a uh, public uh, presence. All right. Uh, outside of my faculty profile page it's at okay. UT. Um, a lot of my stuff I've put up on academia.edu, okay. which I think is probably a shit site, but whatever, it's there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm always happy to share stuff. You know, people want PDFs and stuff. Uh, you know, the book came out with the University of Washington Press and I fought hard with them to get it to be $25. Yeah. instead of 30 plus sure um so you can buy it if you buy it through the website um there's also if you if people write to me i can give them like a friends and family code oh, or great. something that works through the end of the year for 30 percent off but um mm -hmm. i also want to say i always say this you know if you're like a student or you're you know working class person who doesn't really have 25 extra dollars to buy a book and you really want this book for whatever reason, you can always reach out to me and I'll send you a copy. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So we'll put perhaps that link to, uh, I guess it's the publisher that you're talking about on yeah. our page. Uh, and I'm just curious about your takeaway for our podcast. What's something you're going to walk away from kind of like the main thing for you? I think, you know, this conversation is, has really got me thinking or still thinking or thinking again, just about the trajectories that we take and um, the amount of luck that is actually involved in it all. Sure. And I think like, you know, there's no good reason why I should have been the one to get through and the who knows how many others who didn't get through mm -hmm. who were just as smart or probably a lot smarter. Um, there's, there's no good reason for that uh, really, I except for um, a lot of the privilege I hold uh, by virtue of, you know, what I look like, where I come from. And I think the other piece of that is uh, so I had some good luck along the way. Yeah. And so for me, that's what I just been thinking about. Cause it's like, I don't know if you like you ever had a desire to go the tenure track route if you always kind of wanted to go a slightly different route. I actually was kind of being groomed for that uh, a few years ago and I just I just dropped out. So it's a long it's a much longer story on why sure. I did that. But I realized I was gonna have those issues with race. Uh, and I was the only person of color, the person who was there before me. Uh, shared some harrowing stories with me on why she left. And I was like, I'm not putting myself through this. Like it's what everyone wants. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a long story. Yeah, yeah I, well, did. I did. I did. It. It. it was like my whole life was building up to that. And then I, I took this completely different route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, part of that though, I think it returns to luck, right? You landed in a shit situation mm -hmm. by virtue of the job market that year. <laughs> sure. Right? And I ended up in a first, pretty decent job That's and an even great. better second job. Why? Yeah. Well, it happened to be the job market that year and I happened to rise to the top of the pool. Yeah. So I, I just want to say that because I think what I, I've been thinking about a lot is just like we all carry different burdens and we all carry different privileges and we can't take on whatever happens as that it's something about us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and there's that, you know, 
that ego part of, uh, I don't know. I do think there's a difference between ego and the kind of swagger we were talking about because <laughs> I like the swagger part better, but, uh, you know, to not think that you have lost value because you didn't have that luck or the market was a certain way. I think, you know, going through what you go through in graduate school and to get your PhD is, I don't know. I feel like you go through so much with, you know, physical health, mental health. There's so many hoops you have to jump through. There's so much that you have to do. And so if you get out to the other side and, you know, you find the situation is not what you had hoped, don't hold it against yourself. It's not your fault. I mean, that's, I don't know. That's something that I think of. Yeah. Okay. So, so I would like to, uh, I'm going to close the podcast before I do. I want to just uh, thank Dr. Karma Chavez for coming on to the intersection. And uh, I'm so happy that, you know, we could have this conversation and just like have it freely and, you know, whatever we want to talk about, we just talk about. That's what this space is for. And uh yeah, thank you. I do. I have one more announcement. Uh, is that the intersection diverse folks converse is a not for profit project specifically made by and for queer people of color, gender non conforming people. We're a very small project <laughs> that is starting to grow in numbers as far as viewership and interest, which is very exciting. But we are a not for profit project. So if you like what you heard today, it would be great if you could donate to our GoFundMe for production costs only. So, you know, guests like Karma and, and me as the host, we don't receive any portion of these funds. It's purely for production costs. And please subscribe. Please like what you see on YouTube. Tell your friends. And, you know, let's get this passed around more so that more people can be involved and just have access to these programs and these stories. Uh, so to close... You've been here with Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner. I know you didn't put it on there. Dr. Karma Chavez, you just put your name, which is <laughs> fine. Uh, and the episode, what it's season two. So we've been through a whole year. This is the second episode. I'm bulletproof and I don't give a fuck. Queer women of color scholar, Dr. Karma Chavez talks mentorship, tokenism, and intersectionally queering our workspaces. Thank you so much for joining us. You've just finished an episode of the Intersection Diverse Folks Converse podcast. I'm so happy that you decided to join us and you finished the whole podcast to hear all about the stories and lives and the experiences of our guests. I would like to just offer you right now an opportunity to continue to listen to us. You can always find us here at Anchor under the intersection, colon, Diverse Folks Converse, Folks, F-O-L-X, or you can find us on YouTube under Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, L-E-R-N-E-R, -E YouTube channel. We also have a Facebook page also under the intersection, Diverse Folks Converse, that you're welcome to join to find out all about upcoming episodes and guests. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.